All right, protocols part A. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, looking good out there. Yes, sir. All right, so uh, 13 slides in protocols part A. I don't know if you were here a second ago, but part B, uh, I'm not sure where it is on the calendar, but whatever day it lands on, 80 slides. So yeehaw, this fell on a Friday. Um, so nice to put this away early, but uh, if you get a chance, have a pre-look at protocols part B when you get a chance, because uh, most of the meat's in there. All right, so let's look at protocols. This is in the communications, and let's see what it's got to say. You change the PowerPoint style. I try to mix it up, Michael. Keep you guys interested. Yeah, looks really fancy. Yeah, yeah. All right, describe and compare capabilities of digital field devices to that of the analog. So pretty basic. Uh, objective there we're going to look at and I guess this is the transition point between uh, third and fourth year if you will or second and third year and third and fourth year is we kind of wet our toes into uh, heart kind of uh, wholeheartedly I guess uh, no pun intended last year uh, we started talking about heart which I hope if you remember uh, is an analog style uh, that is a hybrid which could be analog with some of the benefits of digital the idea of fourth year uh, in general is that everything is digital. We kind of leave the analog world behind us. That was second year and third year stuff. And we're more worried about digital stuff, especially when we're talking about communication and how we get information back and forth from here, there, and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to just quickly look at uh, the different capabilities between digital devices and those analogs, pros and cons, what they're better at, et cetera, et cetera. And then quickly looking at open and proprietary communication protocols. And open and proprietary are terms that uh, probably most of us are familiar with um, living in the digital age that we that we are. And it basically comes down to who owns who owns the, the rights, I guess, essentially to different types of software or information or anything of that matter. Um, and when it comes to protocols, it's no different. So we'll we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about those. So starting out here with field device communication, since this is a communications course, um, we can identify that field device commu communication can occur in several different ways. And we started out uh, analog communication back in the day. And then this has evolved to today where we now have digital communication. And then we have some that are a mixture of hybrid uh, analog and digital. And these are where the heart type devices uh, fall in where they have uh, some components of an analog device and some components of a digital device. Now, when we're talking about full on, full on heart, if you're addressing, for example, well, then it becomes digital. If you have an address of zero, well, then it's analog. So small detail, not really related, but it kind of puts all of those into perspective. Okay, so back in the 80s, uh, we lived in an analog world. We did not have digital communication systems. And at that same time, HART was developed and the rest is history. So now there are many different industrial communication systems and most of the newer ones are digital. Um, that being said, uh, you know, lots of facilities, major facilities still running uh, twisted pair point to point wiring for their control systems. Um, lots of newer facilities, and I've been out of the construction game for a few years now, but a lot of newer facilities, I'm assuming, are going to digital uh, networking and field bus type uh, protocols, and that's what we're going to be talking about mostly in this course. Okay, so digital devices have several benefits over the older analog devices. Uh, they have a higher measurement accuracy, usually in the order of, you know, 10 times more accurate. Uh, Built-in compensation for things like ambient temperature and a number of uh, other variables. The ability to do uh, linearization uh, on their sensors and also on their outputs, or a good word that goes along with this is characterization, uh, a way to take something that's not linear and, and make it a little bit more linear. Uh, the ability to use many different sensors, so like a, a rose metal transmitter, for example, uh, the transmitting portion of it could use 
a, a number of different sensors, uh, you know, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, uh, different types of things the electronics can do. Um, some of our uh, analyzers can do, you know, pH, conductivity, ORP, all at the same transmitter, just different sensors. Analog communication, despite the fact that it's not the latest and greatest, still does have some good points. They are easy to install and maintain. Um, you know, shielded twisted pair is nice. It's not very complicated as long as you can, you know, strip some wire and tighten some screws. It's not a, it's not a big deal. They have a very high level of reliability. Uh, they provide faster update times. This is probably the biggest significant difference between an analog device and a digital device in terms of the context of the ILM. Um, and the reason that analog devices are faster is because that signal does not have to get converted from analog to digital so that a processor can do its processing and then converted from digital back to analog so that the output signal can be used again. Like if this is what happens in uh, the digital device. Analog is just analog. There's no, there's no conversions at all. So in situations that don't require digital devices, advanced uh, the advanced features that digital devices have, analog is still a good choice, and that's why you still see uh, lots of uh, analog stuff out there. Okay, despite their simplicity and ease of maintenance, there are some disadvantages to analog devices. Uh, no error detection built into them, and we'll learn more about error detection and data. Uh, as we move through the course here, but having error detection is uh, a good way of re ensuring that you're getting uh, accurate data. So no error detection on an analog device. One-way communication, right? It, it's not two-way communication. The transmitter just outputs a signal to the control system and the control system uh, uses it. Limited diagnostics, if any diagnostics at all. You must be at the device in order to configure it versus uh, looking at for example, you can connect anywhere uh, in the loop, so in a nice warm building, preferably. Uh, analog and digital converters at, uh, each contribute some error and will require trimming or calibrating, if you will. Components like the loop resistor also introduce potential inaccuracies. So there's hardware uh, type things in the analog uh, world that introduce errors that are that are bad. Okay, and then also they are only point to point. They don't have the multi-drop capability that most of this unit is built on. So just to make the comparison between analog and digital, and then we're going to be talking largely about the digital uh, end of it as we move through the course. Digital communication, often called field bus, not the trademark field bus, but field bus meaning uh, a bus, and then everything branching off of it. Uh, like we talked about in third year with Hart, uh, it can have up to 15 devices on the bus, all with individual addresses between one and 15. Uh, and you can think of a bus like, like a power line or a power grid, um, a couple wires running overhead and everybody that needs power takes two wires off of it and they get power and that's what a bus is, except of course, uh, it's largely about data in our context, um, but you'll see through different protocols, uh, some are just data, some are data, and in fact, also power. So the advent of digital communication has addressed most of the shortcomings of the analog system. Some of this we learned last year, some of this uh, we were talking about uh, just earlier. So digital communication has error detection, digital communication is duplex communication, meaning that the signal gets sent from the uh, not only the control system to the transmitter, and but also the transmitter to the control system, like analog would. So that's where you basically you get your your diagnostics out of it. The, the control system can go to the transmitter, say, "Hey, how you doing?" And the transmitter can reply, "I'm doing good." And by the way, here's your measurement value uh, in simplified terms. Enhanced diagnostics. Um, Using a, a communicating device, a, a 475 or a T Rex or whatever flavor it is, Honeywell, uh, you can do diagnostics on a transmitter. It'll often tell you, you know, the temperature, uh, 
all kinds of different things, uh, you know, cell condition, wiring, disconnects, so different things like that. Uh, remote configuration, one of the big benefits of digital uh, communication uh, is not having to stand outside in the cold to do configuration, being able to connect anywhere on the bus and do your work. Multi-drop capability, um, when we're talking about field buses, field buses are multi-drop networks, meaning there's a main line and then branches coming off of it in one way, shape, or form. No more analog or digital analog conversions. All the data is digital, just ones and zeros. Some disadvantages, uh, they are more complicated, they are more expensive, and they have more rigid design specs. It doesn't affect us as instrument guys because complicated doesn't scare us. Expensive is somebody else, someone else's problem, and design specs are engineers' problems. So no worries for us. But that's the difference, basically, uh, in little terms of the difference between analog and, and digital. So error detection, how do they do it? Uh, a block check character, and I think we kind of touched on this a little bit before, but a block check character is a method of uh, error detection, and they use that to ensure data integrity. So we now know for sure whether or not whether or not our data that we are receiving and using in our system is good. Because before with analog, we didn't have a way to tell. We just took it at face value, and mind you, it worked out pretty well most of the time. Okay, duplex communication. Two-way communication, if you will, adds advanced diagnostics, remote configuration and calibration, as well as data checking capabilities. And digital, of course, big thing about it here is multi-drop, uh, like heart and many others that we'll be discussing. Um, many protocols use this feature for the same reasons. Um, I don't know if we talked too much about any of these last year, but uh, heart, as you remembered, um, in a bus, Cheaper to, cheaper to wire, less wire, uh, things of that nature uh, are some of the benefits of multi-dropping. All right, a uh, little chart here comparing uh, a hybrid and a digital and an analog device. So it does uh, error detection, analog, no, digital, yes, hybrid, yes, some, right? So analog, think of this as a, uh, I can't remember my model numbers, 3011, whatever, analog pressure transmitter, uh, 3051, uh, heart transmitter would be a hybrid, and then a dig digital, uh, if you configure it to be an addressed device, it would be purely digital. Um, so anyway, analog, no error detection. Analog, no duplex. Analog, basic diagnostics, no remote configuration, error of about 0.1%, and no for multi-drop. Digital gets the full meal deal. It's got all the all the bells, whistles, all the options are checked. It's got leather interior, cooled seats, whole double roller window winders, and the whole, whole bit. 0%, somewhere in there. Hybrid, some of the features, not all of the features, but you'll see uh, an improvement over analog in most cases. Okay, so protocols as we lead ourselves into book B, which talks about uh, different protocols. Um, book B, uh, geez, you know what, it's been a while since I looked at it. I believe it talks about three different protocols and it's a lot of reading and a lot of data. Um, but as I was saying earlier this morning, uh, this PowerPoint is almost over uh, 13 slides. But protocols part B is a 80 slide PowerPoint. So there's lots of lots of data in there. And the reason that there's so much data in book B is because we look at uh, three different protocols and the characteristics and the traits of each of them individually. And the idea is for you to be able to walk away with the general knowledge comparatively between the three different protocols. So it's like me describing a car to you in terms of being a Chevy or being a Ford or being a Dodge, they're all still cars, but they've got differences uh, and they've got similarities. So that's what Book B is all about. That's why it's so long. Um, most of the information is uh, repeated through the different protocols. So let's look at protocols. Uh, in our context, protocols are gonna fall under two umbrellas, either an open protocol or a proprietary uh, protocol. 
An open protocol is one where the specification is available to the public to use for free. Go ahead and use it, no worries. Uh, in the computer world, uh, an open protocol is, is something like uh, Linux, if you've heard of it. Uh, Office Open uh, is, a, is an Office type software program that's free. Uh, proprietary protocols are where the manufacturer holds the quote unquote specification confidentially. So if we were comparing some uh, business software, open office would be an open protocol for doing word processing, whereas Microsoft Office uh, is owned by Bill Gates. And if you want to use it, you got to pay for it. So that's kind of the general difference between open and proprietary. One of them somebody owns and you got to pay them. And the other one is just free to use. Uh, we all want to play the game. Okay, the protocols are designed uh, to transport data to and from field devices, and you're going to find out all the details about that in the next book. In order to use um, either of them, the spec specifications must be followed. So basically what a protocol is, a protocol is a set of rules that are used so that information can move back and forth between different devices. Uh, you have to be able to uh, get data back and forth, and it's not different than sending mail uh, back and forth. We have a protocol when we send mail. We have to have a you know a certain size package for a letter, a certain size package for a, a parcel. Uh, we have to put a, a mailing address on it. We have to put a return address on it. Uh, maybe this is going to be in this corner. A stamp's going to be in that corner. So that's the protocol for sending a package or a letter. When we're sending data, same idea, uh, different different context. All right, uh, open protocols and closed or proprietary uh, protocols we're going to compare here. So what are the advantages of an open protocol? More integration options, meaning that when a protocol is open, more people are likely to manufacture devices on that protocol. Uh, as a result of that, you have less rely reliance on a single vendor. It's like being, uh, you want heart, I guess that's a bad example. If you want field bus, you got to buy field bus. You can't get anywhere else. If you want to buy something that's hard, you can you can get different um, manufacturers. But long story short, open protocols kind of open up the market to everybody. Uh, more predictable in design changes as members vote on the changes. So in the ILM, I think they spend some time talking uh, about that. But basically, if I own a product, I own the protocol on it. I can change it however I want, whenever I want, and you're at my mercy. Um, when we, they're designing open protocols, it's a community um, of people that are sharing. So they talk to each other about it and they vote on changes so that it doesn't hurt anybody and it hopefully helps everybody. Uh, open protocols are easier for the public to acquire, AKA they don't cost money. Uh, less concern of a monopoly. Um, because it's an open protocol, so you're not going to have like a dedicated Honeywell system where you can only use Honeywell uh, transmitters and you got to use the Honeywell PLC and all that kind of stuff. You can mix and match. Easier troubleshooting uh, means that, and that means that there's just more experienced users out there. It's got more of a user base, thereby it's got there's more experience to lean on. Disadvantages of open protocols. Now, less flexibility on features. They're less efficient, uh, not as adept at making changes. Uh, and sometimes there can be incompatibility issues. Um, when you own something and you have very stringent standards, it's easy to make sure that everything uh, is compatible and everything works together. When you have it open, you can build it to work into the system, but it doesn't always necessarily work the way it should. Okay, proprietary. Advantages, seamless integration into their own system. They own it. They built it from ground all the way up. So seamless. Uh, higher reliability, maybe, in theory. Uh, better, in, better efficiency, meaning that they can, they can make changes whenever they want. They can react whenever they want. If they have to do a, a version update. They're free to do the version update whenever they want. They don't have to rely on a group of people getting together and uh, analyzing uh, a bunch of data and then coming to a decision they own everything disadvantages uh, fewer options in software and hardware because it's proprietary you're going to be using their their stuff there's just 
that's it. Single vendor, same argument. Um, users may be wary of buying in, right? You're, am I going to be an Apple user? Am I going to be an Android user? Uh, what operating system am I going to buy into? Are these guys good? Is it reliable? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the thoughts that you have here about being wary have to do with vendor dropping products. Uh, you know, you look at things like uh, Rose Mount and a heart, a heart communicator, you know, 275, 375, 475, T-Rex. Um, at some point in time, they just say, hey, we're not supporting this anymore. You're going to have to buy a new one. Smaller experience pool of users uh, because it's, you know, dedicated and proprietary. You're going to have to go to uh, Spartan Controls, for example, to find the resident experts. Uh, you, and you've got, you know, fewer stations of those collections of people than you do uh, the wide community network that you probably find uh, in the online environment for a uh, open protocol. Capability-wise, comparing the two of them here, open and proprietary, interoperability with other OEM hardware. Um, open protocols, yeah, bring it on. Plug it in, see if it works. Proprietary, no. If we don't make it, it's not going to work in our system. Access to the specification, open open protocol, you can get it, doesn't cost anything. We're sharing, developing, trying to make it better, accessible to everybody. Proprietary, no, you got to pay for it. Uh, likelihood of industry adoption, open, free, good, right? Makes sense. Proprietary, poor. But if you do, if they do buy in, you're going to make some good money. Reliance on a single vendor, open protocol, no. You can pick whatever vendor you want. You can buy this brand of transmitter, that brand of transmitter, Chinese or otherwise. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. Honeywell, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Proprietary, you're hooked. If you buy their system, all their stuff is their stuff. Look at that. That is the end. Nice and easy for a Friday. You got lucky there. Uh, the next one's going to be a wing dinger. I'll tell you that. <laughs>